on out of the bands. And the tops were so loose that the shoes almost dropped off my feet as I walked. I was embarrassed to associate with the other students, so I sat in my room alone and studied. The deepest desire of my life was to be able to buy some store clothes that fit me, clothes that I was not ashamed of. Shortly after that, four events happened that helped me to overcome my worries and my feeling of inferiority. One of these events gave me courage and hope and confidence and completely changed all the rest of my life. I'll describe these events briefly. First, after attending this normal school for only eight weeks, I took an examination and was given a third grade certificate to teach in the country public schools. To be sure, this certificate was good for only six months, but it was fleeting evidence that somebody had faith in me, the first evidence of faith that I ever had from anyone except my mother. Second, a country school board at a place called Happy Hollow hired me to teach at a salary of $2 per day, or $40 per month. Here was even more evidence of somebody's faith in me. Third, as soon as I got my first check I bought some store clothes clothes that I wasn't ashamed to wear. If someone gave me a million dollars now, it wouldn't thrill me half as much as that first suit of store clothes for which I paid only a few dollars. Fourth, the real turning point in my life, the first great victory in my struggle against embarrassment and inferiority occurred at the Putnam County Fair held annually in Bainbridge, Indiana. My mother had urged me to enter a public speaking contest that was to be held at the fair. To me, the very idea seemed fantastic. I didn't have the courage to talk even to one person let alone a crowd. But my mother's faith in me was almost pathetic. She dreamed great dreams for my future. She was living her own life over in her son. Her faith inspired me to enter the contest. I chose for my subject about the last thing in the world that I was qualified to talk on. The fine and liberal arts of America. Frankly, when I began to prepare a speech I didn't know what the liberal arts were, but it didn't matter much because my audience didn't know, either. I memorized my flowery talk and rehearsed it to the trees and cows a hundred times. I was so eager to make a good showing for my mother's sake that I must have spoken with emotion. At any rate, I was awarded the first prize. I was astounded at what happened. A cheer went up from the crowd. The very boys who had once ridiculed me and poked fun at me and called me hatchet-faced now slapped me on the back and said, I knew you could do it, Almer. My mother put her arms around me and sobbed. As I look back in retrospect, I can see that winning that speaking contest was the turning point of my life. The local newspapers ran an article about me on the front page and prophesied great things for my future. Winning that contest put me on the map locally and gave me prestige, and what is far more important, it multiplied my confidence a hundredfold. I now realize that if I had not won that contest, I probably would never have become a member of the United States Senate. For it lifted my sights, widened my horizons, and made me realize that I had latent abilities that I never dreamed I possessed. Most important, however, was the fact that the first prize in the oratorical contest was a year's scholarship in the Central Normal College. I hungered now for more education. So, during the next few years from 1896 to 1900 I divided my time between teaching and studying. In order to pay my expenses at DePauw University, I waited on tables, looked after furnaces, mowed lawns, kept books, worked in the wheat and corn fields during the summer, and hauled gravel on a public road construction job. In 1896, when I was only 19, I made 28 speeches, urging people to vote for William Jennings Bryan for president. The excitement of speaking for Bryan aroused a desire in me to enter politics myself. So when I entered DePauw University, I studied law and public speaking. In 1899 I represented the university in a debate with Butler College, held in Indianapolis, on the subject resolved that United States Senators should be elected by popular vote. I won other speaking contests and became editor-in-chief of the class of 1900 College Annual, the Mirage, and the university paper, the Palladium. After receiving my A. B degree at DePauw. I took Horace Greeley's advice only I didn't go west, I went southwest. 
I went down to a new country, Oklahoma. When the Kiowa, Comanche, and Apache Indian Reservation was opened, I homesteaded a claim and opened a law office in Lawton, Oklahoma. I served in the Oklahoma State Senate for 13 years, in the lower house of Congress for four years, and at 50 years of age, I achieved my lifelong ambition. I was elected to the United States Senate from Oklahoma. I have served in that capacity since March 4, 1927. Since Oklahoma and Indian Territories became the state of Oklahoma on November 16, 1907, I have been continuously honored by the Democrats of my adopted state by nominations first for State Senate, then for Congress, and later for the United States Senate. I have told this story, not to brag about my own fleeting accomplishments, which can't possibly interest anyone else. I have told it wholly with the hope that it may give renewed courage and confidence to some poor boy who is now suffering from the worries and shyness and feeling of inferiority that devastated my life when I was wearing my father's cast-off clothes and gaiter shoes that almost dropped off my feet as I walked. Opening parenthesis. Editor's note. It is interesting to know that Elmer Thomas, who was so ashamed of his ill-fitting clothes as a youth, was later voted the best-dressed man in the United States Senate. Closing parenthesis. I lived in the Garden of Alibi. R. V. C. Bodley. Descendant of Sir Thomas Bodley, founder of the Bodleian Library, Oxford author of Wind in the Sahara, The Messenger, and 14 other volumes. In 1918, I turned my back on the world I had known and went to Northwest Africa and lived with the Arabs in the Sahara, the Garden of Allah. I lived there seven years. I learned to speak the language of the nomads. I wore their clothes, I ate their food, and adopted their mode of life, which has changed very little during the last 20 centuries. I became an owner of sheep and slept on the ground in the Arabs' tents. I also made a detailed study of their religion. In fact, I later wrote a book about Muhammad, entitled The Messenger. Those seven years which I spent with these wandering shepherds were the most peaceful and contented years of my life. I had already had a rich and varied experience. I was born of English parents in Paris and lived in France for nine years. Later I was educated at Eton and at the Royal Military College at Sandhurst. Then I spent six years as a British Army officer in India, where I played polo and hunted and explored in the Himalayas as well as doing some soldiering. I fought through the First World War and, at its close, I was sent to the Paris Conference as an assistant military attaché. I was shocked and disappointed at what I saw there. During the four years of slaughter on the Western Front, I had believed we were fighting to save civilization. But at the Paris Peace Conference, I saw selfish politicians laying the groundwork for the Second World War each country grabbing all it could for itself, creating national antagonisms, and reviving the intrigues of secret diplomacy. I was sick of war, sick of the army, sick of society. For the first time in my career, I spent sleepless nights worrying about what I should do with my life. Lloyd George urged me to go in for politics. I was considering taking his advice when a strange thing happened, a strange thing that shaped and determined my life for the next seven years. It all came from a conversation that lasted less than 200 seconds, a conversation with Ted Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia, the most colorful and romantic figure produced by the First World War. He had lived in the desert with the Arabs and he advised me to do the same thing. At first, it sounded fantastic. However, I was determined to leave the army, and I had to do something. Civilian employers did not want to hire men like me ex-officers of the regular army especially when the labor market was jammed with millions of unemployed. So I did as Lawrence suggested. I went to live with the Arabs. I am glad I did so. They taught me how to conquer worry. Like all faithful Muslims, they are fatalists. They believe that every word Muhammad wrote in the Quran is the divine revelation of Allah. So when the Quran says, God created you in all your actions, they accept it literally. That is why they take life so calmly and never hurry or get into unnecessary tempers when things go wrong. They know that what is ordained is ordained. And no one but God can alter anything. However, that doesn't mean that in the face of disaster, they sit down and do nothing. 
To illustrate, let me tell you of a fierce burning windstorm of the Sirocco which I experienced when I was living in the Sahara. It howled and screamed for three days and nights. It was so strong, so fierce, that it blew sand from the Sahara hundreds of miles across the Mediterranean and sprinkled it over the Rhone Valley in France. The wind was so high I felt as if the hair was being scorched off my head. My throat was parched. My eyes burned. My teeth were full of grit. I felt as if I were standing in front of a furnace in a glass factory. I was driven as near crazy as a man can be and retain his sanity. But the Arabs didn't complain. They shrugged their shoulders and said, Mektub, it is written. But immediately after the storm was over, they sprang into action. They slaughtered all the lambs because they knew they would die anyway. And by slaughtering them at once they hoped to save the mother sheep. After the lambs were slaughtered, the flocks were driven southward to water. This was all done calmly, without worry or complaining or mourning over their losses. The tribal chief said, It is not too bad. We might have lost everything. But praise God, we have 40% of our sheep left to make a new start. I remember another occasion, when we were motoring across the desert and a tire blew out. The chauffeur had forgotten to mend the spare tire. So there we were with only three tires. I fussed and fumed and got excited and asked the Arabs what we were going to do. They reminded me that getting excited wouldn't help, that it only made one hotter. The blown out tire, they said, was the will of all and nothing could be done about it. So we started on crawling along on the rim of a wheel. Presently the car spluttered and stopped. We were out of petrol one the chief merely remarked. Mektub. And there again, instead of shouting at the driver because he had not taken on enough petrol, everyone remained calm and we walked to our destination, singing as we went. The seven years I spent with the Arabs convinced me that the neurotics, the insane, the drunks of America and Europe are the product of the hurried and harassed lives we live in our so-called civilization. As long as I lived in the Sahara, I had no worries. I found there, in the Garden of Ale, the serene contentment and physical well-being that so many of us are seeking with tenseness and despair. Many people scoff at fatalism. Maybe they are right. Who knows? But all of us must be able to see how our fates are often determined for us. For example, if I had not spoken to Lawrence of Arabia at three minutes past noon on a hot August day in 1919, all the years that have elapsed since then would have been completely different. Looking back over my life, I can see how it has been shaped and molded time and again by events far beyond my control. The Arabs call it Maktub, Kismet the will of Allah. Call it anything you wish. It does strange things to you. I'd only know that today 17 years after leaving the Sahara I still maintain that happy resignation to the inevitable which I learned from the Arabs. That philosophy has done more to settle my nerves than a thousand sedatives could have achieved. You and I are not Mohammedans. We don't want to be fatalists. But when the fierce burning winds blow over our lives and we cannot prevent them let us too, accept the inevitable. And then get busy and pick up the pieces. Five Methods I Used to Banish Worry By Professor William Leon Phelps first had the privilege of spending an afternoon with Billy Phelps, of Yale, shortly before his death. Here are the five methods he used to banish, 